Uh, we're delighted to welcome you all to this afternoon's talk uh, by a very special uh, guest speaker, Uma Pagan Ampe Pagan. As many of you know, Uma is a producer and presenter on BFM radio. Um, he presents the evening edition, uh, which is, uh, I think, one of the programs that sort of keeps you sane when you're driving through the traffic. Uh, he also presents uh, Uma and Joe goes to the movies and also Bookmarks, which is a long-running show. I think the only uh, radio show that actually discusses literature and books. Uh, and when Uma isn't doing all of that, he also runs um, the KL uh, the Kuala Lumpur Festival, which is the only uh, festival of ideas in Malaysia and I think the region. So today Uma's going to speak to us about one of Malaysia's first graphic novels, Matsum, uh, which was written by, uh, I think arguably, Malaysia's greatest cultural icon, Dato Lat, whose works are actually included in this exhibition. So before I pass over the mic to Uma, I just wanted to remind everyone, please put your phones on silent, and also that we are recording this session for documentation purposes. At the end of Uma's talk, we're going to have a small uh, Q&A, so uh, if you've got any burning questions, uh, please stick around for that. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Uma. Thank you, Rahel. Um, so, for those of you expecting that a lot, no, you just get me. Uh, <laughs> um, a few notes, I guess, before I, I get into it, right? Um, so, number one, when going out to buy yourself a copy of Matsum, make sure you pick up the orange version, which is the BM version, as opposed to the blue version, which is the English version. Um, it's on, not that there's anything wrong with the translation or the English version, it's perfectly fine. It's a very decent translation. It's just I have an issue with the way the text is kind of laid out. Um, it feels like too much of an afterthought, the way the text is laid out. Um, it feels like bad typeface that just pulls you out of the experience of reading this book like you wouldn't believe. And I, I'll, I'll give you an example. On the left is the Malay version, on the right is the English version, you know. The Malay version's got that, what, what's become that standard lot script. It's his handwriting. And then the English version just has that, which is kind of dull and boring. So yes, buy the orange version. It is good. Um, uh, number two, I am, I, I am in no way an academic or a historian. I am an enthusiast at best, I think, and a critic at worst. Um, I'm pressing the wrong button. There we go. Ah, OK. So. Uh, number three, there was a movie of Matsum that came out in 1990, just a year after the book was published. Now, the movie starred Imuda and Tiara Jacqueline. I, I completely forgot she was in it until I was looking on YouTube for some clips. Um, I, and I remember it being a pretty decent film. I haven't been, I haven't been able to find a copy of the full movie, uh, but there are short clips on YouTube that give you an idea of what the movie is. And it's about 80% it's about accurate and faithful to the book. Uh, but it was 20 years ago when I saw it. I haven't been able to see it again. But uh, I'll get back to the movie in a little while and why I believe it was, it was good and why I believe it was actually that accurate and true to the text. Um, also, it's interesting to note, and I was, I was doing some research and looking out, and I don't think I've seen another comic book to film adaptation before this. I think this may have been the first Malay graphic novel to film adaptation in 19, between 1989 and 1990. So that's an interesting first as well. Um, uh, number four. On the Facebook invite, it says three to five. I am not going to talk for two hours. Um, I, have, I have about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then I really want to talk to you guys because I'm sure you've read it. And I see lots of people of different ages here. And I'm really, really curious as to your reactions to this based on when you read it. Um, I read the book when I, was, when, it, when I first read the book, I was 15 years old. And I didn't get it. Uh, if only because I'd read and been exposed to so much of Lat before that, 
I found it boring. I was like, eh, why is the funny, you know? I'm so used to his single frame comedic pieces. Um, and then I read it again in my 20s and I was like, well, this is genius. Um, so um, that's number three. And number four, if you employ a loose definition of what a graphic novel is, then a lot of Lat's other work also falls into the same category. So Kampong Boy and Town Boy, for example, have much have looser narrative structures than what we're used to in your traditional graphic novel, but they still have a somewhat solid beginning, middle, and end. So you could actually count them as graphic novels as well. Kluwargasi Mamat, which is one of my favorite works of Lat. It's actually just been republished by MPH. It's a lot more crude. It's, it's some of his early work that they've published together. Also is a fantastic example of Lat using the weekly strip as an exploration of how to tell a continuous graphic story. Um, and in many ways, when you read Kampong Boy, Town Boy, Kloaga Mama, it, they all seem like precursors to uh, the story he was trying to tell in Matso in many ways, uh, with, with much younger people. Um, yes, so... Before we begin, I, I love the first few pages of this book because if this isn't a masturbation joke, I don't know what is, right? And Lat gets away with it. It's, it's a great little way to start the graphic novel. And so few people pick up on it. I mean, look at where his hands are, look at the poster, look at him waking up, he's still got one hand in his sarong. And then the line, Angkatan Intellect Barakhla, after that, is genius, right? So, yes, I just want to start with that because that's my favorite part of the book. <laughs> um, so, let me tell you what it's about. Um, Lat tells the story of Mat Som bin Mat Top. He is a kampong boy trying to make it in the city, and it's this age-old tale, and we've seen it a hundred times before, not just in our literature, but in all literature, right? Uh, life is hard, work is hard, eking out a living is hard, and Som is this part-time writer who's trying to bag that full-time gig and then have what hopefully is an easy life in the city. Um, it's also a love story. It's this rom-com full of hijinks and coincidence. Uh, Som is infatuated with his uh, neighbor, Che Yam, who he admires from afar but cannot bring himself to talk to for he's held back by his own insecurities. And uh, on this particular day uh, in which the story begins, um, he's also held back by this letter he's received from his father. Um, and this is... This is, this is him uh, at the bus stop, and you know, you know, he kind of introduces himself, you know, Sai Matsom, Panulis Sambilan, and, it's, it's, and he's trying to struggle with talking to, to her. And I mean, look at her, she's gorgeous, right? And yeah, and, and, and I can understand his, his anxiety. So it is the kind of, now going back to this letter, and this letter is what confuses him, because in the next panel he talks about, you know, I would talk to you today, but not today, I'm feeling a little confused today. And it, this is the kind of letter that you would expect if you were 28, he's 28, living alone in the city and single. It is the letter that is not just urging you to get married, but proposing a suitable bride as well. And, you know, because all of this has already been decided. And of course, as a faithful, filial son, what choice do you have but to obey? But, you know, not without some soul-searching, self-reflection, and a party at what I can only assume to be a Kenny Hills mansion that happens along the way. I'm assuming it's Kenny Hills because he's walking around Jalan Parliament when a car comes to pick him up and the party's nearby. Um, there are characters, there are, there are three characters in this novel to which you are really invested in. Som, uh, being the main one, obviously. Uh, there's Che Yam, who, like him, uh, you kind of only really admire and, and obsess about from afar. And of course, there's the city of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, now, there are very few writers that have, at least in my opinion, captured the city of KL as well as Lat. And I'm sure all of you have read a lot of his work and, and you would agree with that. There's, there are scenes of the hustle and the bustle, there's the noise, there's the countless subcultures that are constantly competing for your attention. All of this is depicted tremendously well in Matsum. And, 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 and what he does is he also manages to capture our remarkable ability to 
code switch and traverse between these cultures. We see it in the Malay characters in the book, in the Chinese characters in the book, and the Indian characters in the book. Um, and when we do it so very seamlessly, um, and, in a short, and in, in as short as possible a time as well, he manages to capture just how hard and unforgiving KL is for the outsider. And the outsider not meaning the foreigner, but meaning you know, our own people who kind of try to make it in the city. Um, now, this is also because this was set in 1989, and KL, in my opinion, at that point of time, was still this very aspirational city, which meant that we were all caught up in that that race to be something better. And, uh, and it really was relentless back in 1989. I was only 10 years old, but I felt it, I swear to God. Uh, and the reality was um, that if you didn't have a good job or a fast car or a beautiful woman, that you would get left behind, right? And that if you weren't in the right scene, you would be a nobody. And this is something that's depicted um, by Lat as well in his opening kind of gambit, uh, he has this little monologue. And it's, it's a monologue that's rooted in the same sense of, I guess, um, Malay submissiveness, but he refuses to even talk about himself in a certain way. He's embarrassed. He's like, I exist. I am one of these 16 million people. Um, and I guess that, 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 that in some ways is proof of my existence. But it's, it's, it's not, he's not blowing his trumpet in any way. Right, and um, and th and that's something really, really fascinating because he doesn't feel him as being somebody yet, you know. Penulis sambilan senang cuba nak jadi penulis gaji bulan, right? That's the ultimate goal, and he's not there yet, so he can't even talk to this lady at the bus stop. Um, like all of Lutz's work, the autobiographical elements are there. Um, Som is a writer; he's a journalist. Pak Samad gives him a full-time job, Samad Ismail uh, of NST. Samad has a cameo in Matsom as well. Um, there are scenes of kampong life that are scattered throughout this book through flashbacks. And uh, Matsom is very familiar. So if you've read any of Lat at all in the past, um, this is a style that he has tried and tested, and it's very true to his form. So. You're not really going to look. You're not really going to find yourself on unfamiliar ground with Matsom. Now, uh, I wanted to speak very quickly about the narrative structure of the graphic novel and also why it worked so well in translating to film. Uh, more than anything else, Matsom is also Lat's most cinematic work, I think. And I know that seems like something very obvious to say because comic books are essentially storyboards, but. It isn't really. If you pick up any graphic novel and if you pick up any comic book, you'll realize that this isn't always the case. And you can just take the greats, right? Just consider the greats for a second. You've got um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse. You've got Majan Satrapi's Persepolis. Uh, you've got Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, which is arguably one of the greatest pieces of American literature. And yet, these books, as books, aren't particularly cinematic. So comic books, on the face of it, can be essentially storyboards, but they don't always, but that doesn't always mean that they actually feel like cinema. Matsom, like I said, begins with this opening monologue. It's a wonderful little piece that hints at what's to come. You know, he talks about receiving this letter later, and you see a little graphic of the letter and its postmark. It teases you with this mysterious letter, and it allows the story to unfold rather slowly, confidently. It sucks you in with just the right amount of information. You know, the, 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 it's about 16, 17, hold on, let me see how many pages in. Uh, no, it's 25 pages in before you actually see the letter he's talking about, right? And it's, it's got just the right amount, in my opinion, what makes a good movie. It's just got the right amount of digression as well. Um, to keep you interested in this guy and his life. Now, his pacing is wonderful, his timing, his use of flashbacks are brilliant. The way, uh, just after this letter, he's, he's, he's um, standing there uh, in the bottom frame and he's saying Freida and thinking, and you see another frame. The frame after that is a frame of water, and that kind of just transports you back to Kampong life, right? Um, and Oh, and, and, and this particular scene, I mean, and, and the way, hold on, I'm going to skip forward because there's this one particular scene that I absolutely love. I'm going the wrong way. I'm not very good at clickers. Is there. The motion of that train at night for me is just beautiful. And that is 
if that isn't cinematic, I don't know what is. Like, there's true, true momentum in that scene. And I think that's why it translates so well to the screen. I think Lat already laid everything out for the director, for the actors. Everything was there to work with. Um, and, you know, those other comic books I mentioned, they've all been translated into film. And if you watch them, the scenes that are direct, directly taken from the book feel clunky in cinema. I mean, the most recent example being Batman v Superman, there are these certain scenes which you see in the graphic novel, but when you see someone doing it in real life, it feels incredibly clunky and awful. Um, also because it was just an awful movie. But that is another lecture altogether. Now, um, does Matsum capture a moment? And I think that's the most important question. And for me it does, and it captures more than just a moment. It captures a way of life, and one that is both immensely local and universal at the same time. I could give this book to anyone uh, from any part of the world, as I've often done. It seems to be a go-to book of mine, gift for someone, and it's immediately relatable. It requires absolutely no contextual translation. But even more, important for that, even more important than that for me is that it requires absolutely no contextual translation for us, the Malaysian reader, and which I feel is an important point to make because, and because all of our culture, all of our popular culture is so segregated by language, by class, by this urban-rural divide that we all have very different experiences of the same thing. And a lot of our fiction and film and even our music does require an act of translation. And, and so we may understand, I'll give you an example, we may understand the movie Jagat, for example, but I can guarantee you that that Indian fella sitting next to you was watching at least 25% more movie than you were because he got it on a different level. And that is something I don't, uh, that is something I don't find with large stories because it, he seems to somehow tr transcend that, right? Be it in Kampong Boy or even in his single frame pieces of, 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 of satire. His ability to capture the micro qualities of who we are make for incredibly accessible pieces of art and fiction. Now, we know that Lat was and is an inspiration to many a local cartoonist and storyteller, but I urge you to go out and check these derivative works and tell me what you see. Because a lot of them may look like Lart on, on, on first sight, but, but the faces don't have character. Their, their bodies don't have motion or the same kind of momentum. I mean, just look at the way he's standing on the train. And, and their dialogue is often stilted, it's functional, and without really, you don't really feel any tone or timber. So when Lart write, when Lart's writing the Chinese pawn shop guy who buys the watch in Matsom and he says Lima Blat instead of Lima Blas, there is, there is a tone and timber in the way he says it. It's not, it's not caricature. And I think that's what's very important. And, and that is what precisely makes, that is what, that is what makes Lart such a genius. It is that he is blessed with both an eye and a year for these things, which is something so remarkably rare. The, the artists and, 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 and writers of something like Gila Gila, for example, were brilliant and revolutionary satirists, and you've read their work. Um, Zuna, for example, is a blunt instrument, um, and, and then C.W. Key, I actually don't know what C.W. Key is doing, but, but, you know, but let's, not, let's not allow the Santa Clausification of Lart, right? That's what we've done. We've kind of labeled him in the popular discourse of, as being our racial and cultural mediator, and I think that actually detracts us from his genius. We kind of put him in that box, and don't let those single frames that you see that symbolize Malaysianness and unity that get shared on Instagram and Facebook every time Merdeka and Malaysia Day roll around. I mean, don't, fool, don't let that fool you into thinking that Lat is nothing more than a purveyor of the feel good because he is as cunning and as cutting a commentator as they come, which is why Matsom still matters. And this is why Matsom is still relevant. It isn't it isn't this black and white critique of city life versus kampong life. It is, it is far more complex than that because um, it, Lat is aware of just how our culture c often comes into conflict with the spaces in which we reside. And, and, and Matsom is the perfect depiction of who we are and who we were in those peak years of the Mahade era, right? In 1989, at the cusp of progress and modernization, we were at odds with our past 
we were uncomfortable with our future, and his message is pitch perfect. And I will get to that message at the end because it's right at the end of the book. Now, reading Matsum today might feel somewhat odd or out of place, uh, even, even unfamiliar, but only for one reason. Here is a piece of Malay literature that is all but devoid of religion. And I don't mean that its characters are devoid of values. They have lots of values. Um, all of that adat is still there. But in contrast to a lot of the fiction we see today, be it in film or literature, a lot of the Malay fiction we see today, that, suffoc that suffocating yoke of state-sanctioned Islam is not at all apparent in this work. Um, this is instead a work that is kind of it's rooted in the P. Ramli era of things, and Lat being a, such a huge P. Ramli fan, you can see where it's coming from. It's, it's even rooted in this quixoticism of early Malay culture, not just pre-Islamic Malay culture, but during those, uh, during those P. Ramli years, right? And Matsum is not, Matsum is not, don't get me wrong, Matsum is not a rebel by any means, because, because apart from Jabat and Mahadeh, there aren't really many Malay rebels. Not really, right? And, and Matsum is not a rebel, not because he doesn't have to be, but because, yeah, actually it's because he doesn't have to be, because throughout this piece of fiction, circumstances kind of go his way. And it's a very, it's a very cunning trope to avoid, to avoid a Malay rebel, that he still gets what he wants, he still gets to question, gets to question the values that brought him up and, and somehow come out okay in the end, right? But what this is, and why this is unique, is that this book, this conversation seems all but lost in the modern Malay discourse. Matsum is an explorer. He is questioning who he is, where he comes from, where he's going, all in an attempt at better understanding himself and his society. He's not rejecting his past or his society. He just wants to learn more about himself and his society. And he does that through this constant questioning of culture and values. And I think that is something that just isn't allowed in today's Malaysia, at least if you're Malay. Um, and that's why this is so unique and may feel unfamiliar to a lot of our younger readers. Um, it might just feel like too much fiction. Now, uh, which, brings me, which brings me kind of to where this stands or where this particular book stands in, I was going to say Malaysian canon, but I really hate that word. Um, I was going to say national literature, but I really hate that word as well. Okay, so just where this book stands in and among all of the Malaysian works, la, okay? Um, so in the, 19, in the 1980s, there was this guy called Elaine Ricard. Some of you might have heard of him. He is um, an academic and a writer, and he was writing these injunctions on one constituted a national literature, and he was writing about Africa. But it is something that I feel is immensely important and kind of works in a Malaysian context as well. Now, a national literature, Ricard wrote, might be seen in three models, right? He says it could be a museum, a mausoleum, or a marketplace. Now, the museum is a rigid classification. It's this, it's this anxious parsing of texts against criteria of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, what is a Malaysian novel? What counts as a Malaysian film? We talk about these things every day, right? Museum. It's very familiar discourse. The mausoleum, the, mausoleum, the mausoleum is this monumental tomb and one that uses literature to incite certain forms of behavior, to produce normative values. Yet again, it is something we talk about on a daily basis. It is also something the state does by co-opting great and not so great Malaysian works and then telling them that they are the standard bearers of social engineering, of who we are, how we should behave and carry on and live our lives, right? Now, Ellen Ricard just rejected those two models, right? He absolutely rejected those two models. And instead, he rested on a national literature of being more like a marketplace of ideas, where literature is this continuous negotiation, a process of constant questioning, and most of all, it has to be one that is inclusive. And that is where I think Lart stands out. Uh, not just as the greatest Malaysian writer of his generation, but of any generation. So consider the greats, hear me out. Usman Awang, Isamat Said, Wong Kui Nam, Salih Ben Jonet, all of them do what great poetry and literature should do, right? It's masterful writing, language, beautiful language that gives you an amazing insight into the lives of others and into the inner lives of others. And yet, if you fast forward, 
you get fewer and fewer of those, but um, I think you think of, you think of Kam Razlan's Dato Hamed and his confessions. You think of the new Tash or micro masterpiece called Strangers on a Pier. Um, and they all do the similar thing. But for me, this, the quintessential kind of Malaysian work or Malaysian experience is something that manages to depict the very notion of our national culture as being a market of ideas. And I think there are only two pieces, and this is arguable and some of you may disagree, but I only think there are two pieces of fiction, uh, two pieces of writing that do that very, very well. Uh, fiction and non. One of it is Rehman Rashid's Malaysian Journey, and the other one is Lats Mat Som. I think what's fascinating about both these pieces of work is that you take off the name of the authors, I think you'd be hard pressed to identify the race, religion, or background of the person who wrote it, right? Um, and I think that, that kind of makes an important point as to what Malaysian literature is. Um, which brings me to the final panel, the final panel of this book, uh, on which Som finally goes on a date with the girl of his dreams, right? She is in jeans and a button-down shirt, free hair and even a freer disposition. She is, he is in a baju melayu, he's just come from a wedding, he's in a sonko, and they're at a rock concert, right? And, oh, sorry, just one thing. I love that, that, I love that you can see Bangkok Bank, which doesn't exist anymore. This, this book is really a time capsule of KL of a certain era, which is fantastic. But that is the final panel, and, and, and that is great, because there is Ramli Sarip screaming his lungs out, hey, orang kota, ingin kau jadi New York. Hidup tanpa batasan, jahil tentang halal haram, kononnya itulah kemajuan, tak mau diri ditertawakan, oh kota ini, inikah yang kau mau, right? And because that for me is, is who we are, right? The guy in the sonko, the girl in the jeans, at a rock concert, uh, a city that has always embraced outside ideas, so much so that it feels perfectly normal for that image to exist. And, and those words, as sung by Ramli Sarip in the context of this book, do not, I don't believe they actually come across as being judgmental. I do not think that he is insulting his audience by saying, do you want to be New Yorkers? I think it's ironic. And that's, it's the perfect summation to this entire graphic novel and our lives as Malaysians. So, and that is all I have for you today, folks. <laughs> Oh, 30 minutes on the dot. Excellent. All right, so questions. Actually, has everyone here read the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hands up who hasn't. All right, one person, two, three, four. Oh, we're doing well, we're doing well. Um, hold on. So, yeah, I, I tried to tear up the book to kind of scan bits in it, but so mine's falling apart. But um, I, before you guys ask whatever questions you might have, I, I have a question for, for you which is, um, at how old were you when you read the book and what was your, what was your takeaway from it? Um, I, d I, I don't know if this is the kind of book that would appeal to someone in their teens. I'm, I, I just don't think it's, it's not like Catcher in the Rye, yeah. <laughs> you know, in that way you're a teenager and you're like, everyone's a phony, I relate so well. No, uh, this one has a little more, I don't know, I think, I think you have to be that working schmo to finally get the pain that Matsum is going through. So, um, anyone? Like, were you all young? when you read it, or did you read it recently? Young person, and very young. Okay, so what was your feel? I mean, did you get it immediately, or? And it was entertaining, the graphics really appealed to me, and I have a confession to me, it was my favorite toilet book. Oh. When I go to the toilet, there's- Perfect size. <laughs> And you can read it in one hand, it's great, yeah. <laughs> all right, so feel free to ask questions, folks. Any questions at all? Oh, one, two, one, two. I just have one question. When was it published the first Nin time? 1989. 89. 89. So, yeah, that midway point in the Mandir era, if you're counting. Yeah, because I read it when it came out. Okay. I read it when it came out. I loved it because it depicts the dilemma of Kampong people coming to town, the dilemma of the culture, 
which I was discovering, which I was starting myself to understand. So I loved it. Oh, for, excellent. So th that's another interesting thing. It, it depicts the cultural, uh, this, this cultural clash uh, that he's having, and I, and I love that. And that's why I say Lot had an easy out, right? Because his father wants him to marry Farida, and, and that's where the rebellion fails, right? Because he's, he's in his head, and he's like, oh my god, you know, I only remember his, this, her as this annoying kid, and what is she going to be like? And of course, when he finally meets her, you know, she's amazing looking, but she's dating this other guy, she's really modern, city woman, and, um, and it's an easy out for him because he's dating this other guy. He doesn't have to go into conflict with his father because by the time he finishes his father's uh, trip back to his kampong to visit his father, he's all but convinced that he's going to try and make this happen because he's got to be the filial son. Uh, and so the easy out for Lat, as in <laughs> to keep him from being true to his family and yet still get what he wants, is to have this other guy in the picture and then he goes out on the date after the wedding, which, uh, yeah, which, is, which is convenient, but sweet as well, so I don't mind it so much. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Uma. Um, Hello. I was about 10 when I read Matt's film, so yeah, and then I, I never picked up on the masturbation joke, so when you said that, I sort of felt a bit of my childhood slip away. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was just wondering, do you, do you ever sort of wonder what kind of person Matt Son would be if he were depicted um, you know, in a graphic novel for this time, ah. this particular period. Funny you say that. A, uh, in September at the Kuala Lumpur Festival, um, Lat did a one-hour session with Cam Razlan, and he kind of hinted at the fact that he's working on a sequel to Matt Son. But that's all he would tell us. Um, he said he's working on his biography, which comes out in two weeks. Um, oh, actually, no, next Saturday, next on the 19th, it's launched. Um, and he said he's working on a sequel to Matt Som, but I harassed him afterwards, but he would tell me nothing. Um, so, no, I, I don't know. You see, the romantic in me wants them to have lived happily ever after and be very frustrated at the way things are now, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they became crazy conservative and shunned these sorts of hair concerts now. Who knows? Uh, but I, I, I think only Lat can tell us that, right? Um, there were, lots of, there were lots of cameos, uh, if you read the book, Saleh ben Jone is in it, um, you know, like I said, Pat Samad's in it, Ramli Sarip's in it, Ramli Sarip was also had a cameo in the movie. Um, so he really captures um, the kind of people at the time as well. For me, one of my favorite scenes in the graphic novel is the party scene as well. It's, this, he, it's a very short bit, he gets picked up on the side of the road in Jan Paliman by a poet and this girl who's like his groupie in what looks like the back of a Porsche, they go to Kenny Hills, um, and he's kind of overwhelmed by the fact that he's in this big house, it's a pile of kale he's never been to, and he sits by the pool and has this flashback of, uh, 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 it starts off with a baldi in the river, right, and he's taking water, and um, yeah, it, it's just for me, that, that's one of, the, the, one of these great moments of, of, of dichotomy between the opulence of Kuala Lumpur and then where he comes from, and he's constantly struggling with that, it's really cool, pretty smart. Any other questions? Hi. Um, I just want to share that um, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Tokyo, one of the universities in Tokyo, they have a Malay language course. So they actually use Matsum, the Malay version, um, as part of their syllabus. So okay. every year they'll take 20 books, they'll order 20 books of Matsum for their students that is to cool. learn Malay. That is cool. Yeah, and of course, Kampung Boy was translated into Japanese. Two years ago, right? But they take the Malay version. Very nice. Ah, very good. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, my, my late father isn't around because he passed away 10 years ago, but Lat was like his favorite author. The thing is about, about Lat is that the Malays like him that came from rural areas to town, they can identify with Lat's work. And for me, being a second gener generation urbanite, I'm slowly moving away from that rural thinking. So sometimes, you know, I can't even pick up a lot book nowadays because it's like a throwback to the eras gone by when, you know, since you're talking a lot about Malays, right? Those were the times where the Malays were more in sync with, uh, with the united vision of our post-independence days. So when, you, when, when people like me uh, read 
uh, last work nowadays, it makes me sad. You know, because uh, our national consciousness has changed. You know, so Lat captured uh, the times gone by where people were more honest about yeah. things. So sometimes it's quite sad when I when I pick up a Lat book. That's from my own perspective. You know, I, I don't think you're alone. I think I don't think you're the only one. Um, like I said, when we had that session with Dato Lat. A lot of people in the audience brought that up during Q&A and they were like, you know, yours is a big nostalgia piece. But unfortunately, when we look around us in KL or Malaysia, it doesn't feel that way anymore. Uh, but what I think that's one of the magic of Lat in what he does to get, in what he does, in that I have never grown up in a kampong. I do not know what that experience is like. I was born and raised in KL and yet, when I read Kampong Boy, I have this yearning for a kampong life. I don't know where that yearning comes from. I've never... Eh, and I'm like, oh, those were the good... No, they weren't. I, they weren't my good old days. But, but when I read him on the page, I feel like it. And I think... And, you know, I was telling Rahel before the thing, I, think, I don't think Lat's just one of our greatest cartoonists. I think he's our greatest writer. And I think no one gives him that credit. The, just because he uses pictures and somehow it's not the same as being a poet or a, or, 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 or a writer, right? But when you read his books, nothing has captured... Malaysian culture the way he has and to do it without cliche or stereotype or fall into those standard tropes and traps that we often do it's incredible yeah hmm. I'm really looking forward to that biography can I comment something on what you just said Shoot. when I was young when I picked up a light book at eight years old it was entertaining you know it was like cartoonish right but as you grow older at 42 then you understand what's the, the hidden messages, just like Piramdi movies. It's Correct. what we Malays call the Tersirat, you know? Correct. What the message was uh, all about. So, you know, with all that is going on in the country right now, we do need that, those moments to come back. So, it has its own political undertones, oh, yeah. the book. You get what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and what... Uh, Lat has done is that he transcended race, culture and religion everybody can identify, even my Indian friends can identify Correct. oh this is where my grandfather came back uh, came from you know, you know th those kind of things, so I just wanted to comment what you just said, yeah, which was absolutely. very very interesting no you're right, it, it, it transcends race for that reason right, and, and when I said about some of the newer more derivative works not having character in their face, sometimes they, they see, Lat, Lat always went for the punchline there was a punchline in his single frame comics. He was trying to tell a joke, he was trying to make you laugh. But the way he depicts these characters, the way, you know, even in a single, so there, there's no filler. If you look at his other works and his single works, right? Everyone has a purpose and everyone is doing something at any purpose. If there's two bayis on a bike, uh, the center frame is where, you know, whatever is happening or whatever conversation is going on. But there's, the background is not filler. Every person has character, the way they stand, the way they walk, the w whatever they're doing. And I think that is incredible in capturing um, individuals and the various races and types of people and all of that, which is pretty amazing. Uh, hi, I I'm, I'm just want to share uh, about my experience with LUT today. Um, I first read LUT is uh, one of the book uh, brought uh, bought by my cousin actually, it's a uh, older cousin of me, a lot slots, lots slots, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm very, I'm, I love that book actually. That's uh, the the first introduced me to lot actually, and then uh, that the one that I remember, I tried to I pick up this Kang Pung Boy actually yesterday and today. Actually. So that's one thing that I can relate to. Uh, one of the is work that I can relate to because of the Kampung boy, and then I I just know that he was uh, you know grown up in Ipoh because I I, mean, I I was grown up in Ipoh actually, so I pick up this town boy actually, and I feel so I relate to so well because I live in actually closer to his old house in Sungai Rokam actually, which is I regularly go there in Swingarokam. But when I took up the piece of uh, Matsum, I cannot relate to that actually. Right. Uh, at first because of, it's too poetic for me actually. And then the scene 
uh, depict in the Matsum actually. It's urban actually. It's very urban. It's a KL. I live in Ipoh on that time, it's 90s, actually, early 90s. Um, uh, not that urban actually. Yeah, we have some actually. Uh, Jubilee Park in Tom, Tom Boys. Uh, yeah, this depiction of Jubilee Park is so. Because I'm, yeah, myself going to Jubilee Park <laughs> for this entertainment, actually. <laughs> so, I think it's a much, so at that time, actually, I, I really read it so fast, actually, because I cannot relate because of the, because of the, 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 the maybe the culture itself, actually, maybe the, 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 the was environment. It but was it because it was, do you think it's the, do you think it's because it's scale of 1989 or? I think because or just in just the urban I KL, think, uh, yeah, because because the the focus on the KL actually, and then right. at, at that time I I was a yeah small child I was uh, 20, twelve actually uh, thirteen I just trying to just to get to know the world, and then and then I tried to read it again actually after ten years maybe twenty years after, and yeah I I and then it struck me that I can actually relate that when I. I was I living in KL. Because, today. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you're right. So, I think it, 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 it you you need some experience. See the nostalgia pieces which uh Kampong Boy and Town Boy and um and even his depictions, his Merdeka Malaysia Day type stuff, all the stuff that depicts the past is actually quite easily relatable because even if we've never lived it, we've grown up hearing stories about it. And whether you went to wherever you went to school in Malaysia, that is a standard story that you're always told, right? Uh, about Kampung life and about what Malaysia was like in the past and stuff. So there's an immediate relatability. But if you are from somewhere like Ipoh or even Penang, even somewhere urban like Penang, I think KL is a very different experience. So yes, you're right. I think in understanding and appreciating Matsum, I think that's why I couldn't appreciate it at 15 as well. I had no idea about the hard life, uh, trying to work and having to pawn your watch so you can buy food and stuff like that. And I think that's only something you get later uh, when you've actually experienced a city. But it doesn't matter what city, right? Um, I, think it, I think other people have that exact same problem. So yeah, you're right. Sorry, Matt. Also just Go wanted to it. ask you uh, what you think of the depiction of, um, of Malaysian women in the city, because this is very much you know, the tale of a sissy boy. Yeah. But you sissy women, I, I remember there's a there's a sort of panel in Matsum where um, he's in the taxi and the taxi driver, he and the taxi driver looking at the women at the bus stop and going, oh, you know, these, these, these city girls, they're so sort of sophisticated and unattainable. That's right. And also, you know, the portrayal of women in Matsum, it's still from a distance, you know, as you it's, said. It's always from a distance. So, I mean, yeah, I want, want to know what you feel about yeah, that. Yeah, no, correct. You're right. You're right. It's always from a distance. Also, the taxi driver says something really funny, right? He goes, guys like us. And uh, and Matsum has this revelations like what does he mean guys like us am I part of that us like and um, yeah no um, that's that's something very interesting in the book because obviously all of the women you see depicted in the in the book are through are through his eyes and also are th objects of desire uh, whether it's in the taxi cab or whether it's Farida well she didn't start off as an object of desire uh, except for the young children right. Um, I don't know. I think it. I think it serves its purpose in this story. I mean, in this story, it has a it has a very 80s feel. It feels like a lot of. That's why I think it's very cinematic. The the way the story plays out feels like a lot of 80s rom coms we used to watch from Hollywood as well. And I think that's probably where Lart got his inspiration of, for structure. And yeah, I, I, but you're you're absolutely right. You don't get. Uh, but Lart does write very strong female characters in his other books. His teachers. Um, uh, mother, uh, uh, matriarchal characters are all there and they often, they often run the home and the school and all of that stuff. But in this, no, yeah, it's Manic Pixie Dream Girls all the way. Yeah, totally. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Anything? Thoughts? Critiques? Did you just hate it and disagree with everything I say? You could. <laughs> Um, are you guys, so do you guys, actually I'm curious, do you guys read a lot of Malaysian um, uh, graphic art, like graphic novels or comics? I mean there's quite a big scene now, uh, uh, Maple Comics puts out quite a lot of decent work, um, there's a lot of stuff on the web, no, yes, no, 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 well you should, yeah. 
Oh yeah? Okay, it's, 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 it's good. I mean, so the more and more people are doing it, and more and, pe more and more people are trying to do it, but there's no lot, la. there's no, there's no, there are great artists, and then there are great storytellers, and he's managed to br bridge the gap to both really, really well. Um, there's a fun story about how, about why all his characters stand in a curve. I don't know if you guys know the story. So, um, he, his mentor, whose name I can't recall, sorry? Yes, who used to, used to, draw, his used to draw his characters at an angle. And essentially, in his head, Lot was just like, well, if I did that, then I'd just be copying him. And so he had to come up with a unique way to which to depict his characters. And so that's why in all of his characters stand in a kind of curve um, shape, which is quite, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Shoot. Yeah, since we're on the subject, right? It looks like an anthropological study Oh, this on, one? Yeah. <laughs> on, no, on my race. Called, called, called a race. Yeah. yeah. I would like to know from the floor, if uh, from a non-Malay perspective, on a depiction of what they would call a good Malay. Okay, why I say this? I think a few months ago, I think two months ago, there's a, there was a talk here on the, about Islam and all that, right? So recently, I, I just... You know, just follow me for a while. Sure. Recently, I came back from a mosque in Damansara Heights, so I had te tarik. I was wearing a, a Arab jubah, you know, the, the long Arab dress. But I wore that just for simplicity rather than just to, uh, to show that I'm more Muslim than <laughs> other people and all that. Oh, it's very comfortable, airy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so a uh, an old Chinese man approached me and he asked me, can he sit next to me? I said, yeah. And then he asked, why are you wearing this Muslim dress and all that, you know? I wish you Malays were like before. I said, what do you mean by before? Oh, you're wearing your sampan, you go, you're wearing your kempele card, you're more Malay. I said, this doesn't make me less of a Malay. So whenever I come to talks like this, the focus is all, always on Malays. But I like to know from you know, from my non-Malay friends here, what does this show, what does it say about the Malays? What is from their perspective? You know, I know who's the ugly Malay nowadays. You know, if I was uh, meeting Dato Lat, I, was, I will ask him, how will you de depict Jamal Yunus now? You know, you know how will you depict him, right? But i like to know from the perspective of a non-Malay, this shows what? Is this the idea of a Malay or, you know, the Malay should be like this, nice, and all that. You know, that kind of thing I'd like to know from that angle. If there's somebody from the floor, or even you. Cool. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Anyone? I mean, I'll start by saying that I think this is a, that's a great, that's a great panel that kind of depicts the multitudes of Malay culture in one thing, right? And I think that's why I like this panel so much, and as a last page, and what he's trying to tell with this story, which is that... KL in the 1980s and the 1990s, when it was in the cusp of this change, we were so ready and willing to accept, um, I don't even want to call it outside influences. We were just influences. And all of these subcultures existed. And he, and he goes through them, right? He goes through, he goes through that poetry reading, uh, goes to that party. He, um, there's a scene when he's trying to make up his mind and he sees a preacher on television. Uh, talking about what to look for in a good wife, and so there are all of these all of these things that happen, and I think that's something that is probably lost in a lot of today's discourse, where you we don't accept the multiple inputs as much as we should, and he's trying to say actually the multiple inputs are there and they're not bad, um, they can coexist perfectly. Um, and you know, and even in the previous frame, um, uh, all of the it's like it's like Moses parting, right? All of the hair rockers are kind of looking at him because he's wearing a baju melayu at this rock concert, right? So even they're surprised, but you know, there's immediate acceptance already. So um, yeah, so I think 
I think that's one of the things that's missing probably from Malay discourse as well as Malaysian discourse. Because right now, what you're exposed to and what you get and what all of us get on television is, you know, we get... Um, if you look at movies, and I, I think I blame Munafik for this because it made so much money. Everyone, everyone, I promise you, over the next two or three years, you're going to see a heavier um, Islamic angle of influence in these films because they know that's what makes money. So because Munafik did it, uh, Indonesia went through that same phase of like Islamic influence horror movies. Uh, it's another movie that's coming out in about three weeks called Desolasi. And if you watch the trailer, it looks science fiction-y. There's like dinosaurs and stuff. But from, from what one of the other critics tell me, it's actually yet another movie that's very rooted in um, Islamic discourse. So that's what I found particularly interesting about this, that there is no Islamic discourse except for that preacher on TV. And I think that's very symbolic of how our discourse has changed in Malaysia and how Islam has become more prevalent in the discourse. Which isn't a bad thing, it's perfectly fine. It's just that you're told that you can't have, you're told that you can't talk about it and question it and that's the bad thing, right? Um, but yeah, anyone from the floor wanna? Okay, oh, maybe, maybe. Two people. Ah. Okay. Just a quick one, just ah. a quick one. Ah. Okay. Um, I'm a pendatang actually. My grandparents came from Indonesia. Right. Right? So whenever I, I go back to Indonesia, I see my Indonesian brethren, right? They're very in touch with their culture, right? But the Malays now, you know, we've slowly moved on. In, we're, quite, we're quite a confused lot. You know, my, my dad uh, listened to Kronchong. I don't. You get what I mean? Uh? I like to wear Indonesian batik. I think Malaysian batik is a bit different. <laughs> you get what I mean? Uh? But yeah. from a Malay perspective, right, I think... We, we, are not, we are not in touch with our culture. We are too much into uh, outside influence, as you call. But this is the difference between us and Indonesia from a Malay angle. Do you, yeah. not, do you not think that they can, both, they can all coexist? I mean, this picture shows that it's actually a clash of civilizations to me. It is. You get what I mean? But in the 80s and 90s, it was but a perfectly where, comfortable where that, clash. Where does that guy <laughs> wearing the baju melayu with that song coat is even tilted to the right? Yeah, like I know, in the right? old days, right? Yeah. <laughs> but where does it fit in? So this picture says that, you know, the Malays are not trying to fit in in that baju melayu now. They're trying to be like Ramli Sarip. You get what I mean? So the point is, we only wear baju melayu doing raya and all that, then that's it. <laughs> you get what I mean? So this is where I think that the Malays slowly, right, we're forgetting our culture, you know, you can say it's governmental pressures, you can say it's Islamic pressures and whatnot, right, it's, but it's, we, it's, don't, we don't really hold on to, you know, the things that yeah. uh, Malays it's, has always been identified It's societal with. pressures as well, actually, I would say more so than governmental pressures, we do it to ourselves, that surveillance has become surveillance and, but carry on. Okay, um, I would like to offer a point of view from a female Shoot. and an outsider as well uh, because I ca I'm from Penang. I came to KL in 1999. So, okay, it's okay, Penang people are Malaysians too, I'm just saying. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, uh, first uh, confession, I got this book many years ago but I didn't read it until this year okay. because I wanted to get Datuk Lau's autograph and I thought, okay, I better read it. And I read like half of it and then I got his autograph and then I misplaced it so I didn't finish it. <laughs> okay, but I could identify even though uh, this book is in Malay about a Malay guy, I can identify with it because uh, even though Penang is a very urban place, but when you come to KL, it's so different. I recall uh, when I was uh, some, during the 1980s, at that time we were living in uh, Kuching. So what we would do, we always balik kampung, we would take the flight from Kuching to KL, and then we take the train to go to Penang. So when we come back to Penang, the, the view that always stays in my mind is when the train pulls into the station, you see all these skyscrapers, and that was KL to me. It's like, wow. And then when I came to KL, I uh, fought to work. It was also like, wow, I wonder how I will fit in. Because uh, if you don't have any friends, it's tough. And I remember telling my dad, I wasn't sure whether I'll be... Uh, at that time, when I moved to KL, I was in Kapong. I wasn't sure whether I, I was going to be a Jinjang Jo or a Bangsa Bae. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so Kiel. basically that's my experience as an outsider coming into KL. I, I, I get what he's trying to say. 
Kale's hard, man. It's really hard. I mean, you, you, I mean, despite what he, I mean, apart from what he depicts in the, in the, in the, in the graphic novel, you kind of hit the nail on the head on why Kale is so hard. Whether you come in from uh, Penang, which is also urban, Kale's another beast altogether. As in, you're right, different subcultures, you don't know where you fit in, if you've got no money, um, if you've got no friends, it's, uh, it's a very difficult place. I mean, it's so difficult that people from PJ find KL hard. I mean, that's, that's how hard KL is, but yeah. You got one person there? Well, um, just to comment on what his, his question is, and I also agree, I'm a PJ person and I find KL hard. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Anecdotal evidence come true. <laughs> yes. But, um, okay, I only vaguely remember Mat Som because uh, back in my primary school library, we had an entire collection of uh, Lat's La books yeah. at the time. And uh, there okay, was no need... Before you carry on, can I just have a confession to make? My first copy of Mat Som I stole from my school library. <laughs> so yeah, we all had it. Like, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I say stole, I checked it out. I just never returned it, but carry on. Okay, um, so... At that time and throughout my entire childhood and teenagehood, there was n no reason to actually buy a copy of Lars book because it was in someone's household or in a library somewhere. Yeah. You know, you always had access to it. And I only bought one like when I was an adult. But uh, now looking back through with nostalgia glasses of at least Kampung Boy and Town Boy, if not Mat Som, uh, there was always just a little bit of this romanticized uh, depiction of every race. Hmm. There was there was no uh, there was no like vilifying of any particular culture in, in you know if, even if, if like let's say you know the the rocker culture probably might seem he he portrayed the culture shock but he never really depicted it as a negativity in itself, but you can see that Lard was very fond of the traditions of every single race so you know he would sort of put a little bit of a gentle stereotype where everyone was dressed in their traditional outfit hmm. but at the same time when we get over to something like town boy you see people dressed in. Uh, casual working attire as well. So I don't think he was trying to put too much of a racial identity into his books. At least that's how I uh, always felt. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you're right. I think there was a, there was a softening, for sure, um, in capturing the different races and the different people. Uh, but there was a certain accuracy to that as well. He didn't lie about things. He just need not necessarily portray the bad side of things, right? What he did capture, whether it was Indian, Chinese, Malay, was very, very accurate. And I think, just to answer your question again, I think um, sometimes when you're informed by literature in that way, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think we could do, we could do better to be informed by literature and fiction in that way about the other, right? Um, so that's very interesting. I mean, the reason I often classify Lat quite highly as well is when you read a lot of uh, Malay fiction, even Isam Ad Said, Osman Awang, just beautiful stuff. Uh, but you can, but but it is for a lot of Chinese and Indians reading it an insight into the Malay mind, into the other mind, and um, and that's probably the best way to know your fellow countrymen. But with Lat. I feel that he gets inside our minds as well. So when an Indian person talks or a Chinese person talks or depiction of an Indian Chinese person or uh, a Sarawakian or a Sabahan, it's like he's, he's not channeling that from a Malay perspective. He's channeling that person, which I find interesting. And, and that has a lot to do with his journalistic background, I'm sure of it. I mean, I think because you sent down assignments and, you know, and, and that's how he apparently got some of his earliest inspirations. He will you know, talk to the Bai shop owner and the guy will send him to like, um, oh, you know, you can go and visit a Sikh wedding at this place. And so he was very on the ground, hands on, very journalistic in his approach, even to writing comedy, right? Yeah. Hi, um, so I have a confession to make. I've not actually read this book, but, but now I you're going to. <laughs> yeah, I am going to. But the thing is, so I've read Kampong Boy, mm -hmm. and uh, I read it as a kid. I'm born in 1992, so. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and and Kampong Boy is great because it's simple. You know, I can live vicariously through this Kampong child who, at that time, seems great. I've not read this book, but from the discussion going for. Uh, 
right now, it seems that there are certain themes, you know, a Malay life or a, at least a Malay mindset coming to KL, trying to make it in KL and a prosperity or some promises of KL. And what I'm trying to ask here is if I'm going to read this book now, what sort of lessons should I be able to draw from it? Because I feel like my experience and I, I believe I speak for many of my peers who are born, raised in Kale, who's used to the skyscrapers, who, <laughs> who have heard so much promises about, you know, how Wawasan Dua Pulo Dua Pulo and, you know, just seeing... It's 2050 now, right? I, I right, lost track. I exactly. lost track. Which and makes no sense. 2020 <laughs> vision, perfect. Uh, anyway, and there was a metaphor there. <laughs> anyway, sorry, carry on. And what I'm trying to say here is maybe we are not as in awe of Kale as perhaps my parents who, you know, they're like, yeah, we come from this kampong, we come to KL, and KL is like, wow, so flashy. I mean, for me and many of my friends, they are actually telling me, hey, you know what? Don't come to KL. Everything's so expensive. Mm. If you can't stay abroad, you know, don't come back. So what I'm trying to say here is if I'm going to pick up this book now as a female, as a millennial, as a Chinese, would I be able to relate to Matsum? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Um, I am a child of the 80s, and there were always skyscrapers. We were just smaller, so they've gotten, they've gotten taller, but they, were always, they always seem pretty big. The buildings in KL always seem pretty big. So, I mean, in that sense, I don't think you're going to... There's not much that's different, right? You know, the Bangkok Bank building might have been pretty tall. Now we've just got buildings that are taller. But for us back in the 80s, that was huge. So. Yeah, so in that sense, I think the city itself, that the, 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 the urbanism of the city has, is still there. You'll still be able to relate to that immediately. Um, I think you'll also be able to relate, even though you've been born and raised in KL, I think you'll also be able to relate to the, the hardness of this town, especially when you start working, especially when you, have, you need to make your own money. Uh, this is a very hard city. And when I say hard city, I mean, it's a combination of everything, right? It's the traffic, it's the cost of living, it's all of that stuff. And that is exactly what, and, and throughout all of that, you know, you've got to find love, you've got to make a family, you've got to have a good job, and all of this stuff. So, and that's the kind of stuff that he struggles with. And that's why I said initially that it was a very local story, but it was also a universal story. Because you could set this as someone from the Rust Belt in America, ending up in New York, and just going, what? And, oh, actually, don't go as far. Malaysian going to some big city in Europe or the United States and just going, what? So I think those, those experiences and those massive contrasts are existent anywhere, right? Um, so I don't think you'll have a problem relating with it. I think as a, as a Chinese female, you'll probably have more of a problem relating to it because it is a very male story. Um, but you don't have to relate to every story in that sense to get it and appreciate it, right? So I, I'm trying to think of an example. The most drastic example I can think of is, I love superhero movies. I don't relate to any of them. You know, they're extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, but yet I enjoy it and I appreciate the artistic value of it. And I think that's what you'll get out of it more than anything else. Uh, you may not even share, I think you may only share maybe 25% of his experiences in this. Uh, yet again, you're going to leave out the kampong stuff, but that, that filial piety is something that you're going to have as well as Malaysian that transcends race and generation as well. Your, you, that sense of um, loyalty to your parents and doing what they want and trying to keep them happy and all of that stuff. And then that conflict between religion and culture and modernism is something that hasn't changed at all, I think we still experience that. We still talk about that on a day-to-day -day basis. It's still in our fiction, in our movies. Um, so yeah, so there's plenty in here for you to take away. So I highly recommend it. Um, yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Um, my name is Ilham. I'll try to make it as uh, clear as possible uh, about what I want to convey and from I came also the second half of the whole session just now. I didn't really um, join in the whole session, I mean, the first part of the session. But then from the um, responses, and I mean, uh, from all the, all the, some of you guys just now, right? So uh, there are a few points that I would like to cover. <coughs> uh, 
Firstly, on the part of Kuala Lumpur. Eh? Kuala Lumpur, after getting off the train and seeing what Kuala Lumpur was and what yeah. Kuala Lumpur is right now, right? Uh, Kuala Lumpur right now, it is a, every other city is pretty much the same. Eh? And this is like a melting pot. Eh? It's kind of, kind of historically, eh? kind of historically, Mekah eh? was in between Syria and Yemen, mm -hmm. where people would cross and it's always busy. And uh, it's a trading place, it's a, where commerce happens and those kind of things. So you can see a lot of different types of people in, in one country. Tapi, we have to know what's from this land, uh, geographically, what we learned before. Yeah. Okay, that's one point, yeah, and that's cool. And, and that's cool, and the comic, there, very cool. Uh, yeah, apa dia nak cakap? Ya, yeah, Mahmud Melayu tu, the one who's wearing baju Melayu. Right. It's not the appearance, kan? Because Melayu is, you no. Know, I mean, what's good is what's inside, then. But then on 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 a um, visual, maybe to draw it like that, right? Dua ada adab, eh, bukan adab lah. Dua ada apa ni? Um, bawa diri elok, kan? You you carry yourself alright. You are decent, right? Yeah. You are, right. And also on the New York bit, because they historically also, well, the New Yorki, yeah, they lost their that shot were the slaves who were brought to to America. Um, the rappers can they don't know their culture because they, they came from somewhere, but then it was cut off from them and their their roots of things. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, and the what was the last point just now? There was a last question from the about relatability. What was it about again? Were you talking about relatability? We can uh, to to um, to add on uh, from another. Friend of ours is now. Oh, uh, about what the modern Malay is? Well, well, if I can recall later, I'll just let you guys sure. know. Sure. Yeah. No, I was just going to say the, um, uh, uh, you know, his intro opening monologue. Um, if sorry, you I want to end. Sorry, sorry. Uh, go, go. No, no, carry on, carry on. I mean, it should be an introduction. Uh. My grandmother just passed away. Okay, that's my auntie. Uh, my grandmother just passed away not too long ago, and then the stuff that I discovered, well, that I somehow got, and was too light published books that I haven't gone through. And, I mean, and then yesterday I saw an event is going on, going on about light, and I'm glad that I'm here, and at least I have some two books of light from my grandmother's face. And keep, <laughs> keep those editions. I know, I, yes, They'd I probably be worth a lot of money. How, how many... <laughs> how many um, uh, oh, Banya. Yeah. Uh, no, because oh, I've lost count. Because yeah. they also repackage, can? Yes. So later, when they republished and they um, they would repackage different comics and stuff like that. So they would take old stuff, and then right, he's got right. a select collection from yeah, the Mahdi era and all that stuff. So yeah, so there's a lot lah. But if you go to MPH or something, there's a lot of they right. have a yeah, they have all sure. of them there. So yeah, you can check it out. Thank you. Cool. No, so the um, the introduction. I mean, I'll read it to you in. English, in case any, so everyone understands it. But he talks about exactly that problem, right? Where he goes, statistics-wise, there's proof I exist among 16 million Malaysians. He talks economy-wise, though I'm sorry to say that lately my position, bit by bit, moment by moment, second by second, proves to be heading for the dumps. But that's no problem. Economic slumps don't last. What bothers me a bit right now, let me be frank, is two-pronged. Socially, I am still what, might some, what some might call a mess. A mess, messy, whatever. That's one. Number two is this letter I got yesterday. So, you know, I mean, he's, he's a part of this bigger... I mean, he feels the weight of this, of the city, of this economy, of all of that stuff, which is, I think, something that all of us can immediately relate to, right? Because we all feel that every day. Anybody else? Or am I off the hook? Oh, this guy. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay, I just want to share something. Uh, actually, i quite surprised that there are a lot of Malays reading Malay comics. <laughs> okay, because I've grown up reading Malay comics, and I think uh, especially during early 90s until 2000 something, uh, Ujang, Gila Gila, yeah. and all. So I think. When I first read uh, Mat Soms, uh, it was belonged to my father, and my father was a huge fan of Gila Gila and Ujang. Uh, and I think uh, those comics in that era, it depicts uh, the struggle of most of the Malay in KL, because they, uh, I think most of them were not from KL. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so uh, I think until now we can see, as, as, uh, especially during Hari Raya, 
so the KL will become empty. And so my father, uh, my parents both are from Kedah. So uh, that's why I think he, he is a huge fan of uh, Matsoms and light. So when, when we read Matsom, we, we can see how the struggle of the working class, a single, a single person came to the city and tried to survive. And then I think it happens uh, to a lot of uh, Malay in KL. And then I think uh, uh, yesterday I just uh, had a conversation with a Kelantanese guy. Uh, he told me uh, when he first came to KL, early 2000. So uh, his experience is more or less like Matso as well. So he struggled, he, uh, he lived in a sitting gun in a slum, a very cheap rent and all. Uh, so, and then uh, he has, he had a few experience, bad experience, uh, good experience, and uh, with other races as well. Uh. So, I think uh, Matsum, uh, for me, I think uh, Matsum is not only about uh, Malaysian, and he also uh, depicts the struggle of the working class in Malaysia. And I think if we talk to uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of working class, a lot of young, profe not young professional, I think a blue collar, mm. blue collar persons, we can somehow relate their stories to Matsum as well. Yeah, so I would suggest if you guys are, in, are interested to read more on Malay comics about uh, in the same genre as Matsum, uh, maybe you can try Ujang, uh, Aku Budak Minang and Acha. Yeah, Ujang stuff's great. Yeah, so um. that's all. Thank you. Yeah, oh, uh, the one last thing, uh, which is the, uh, we've talked a lot about the art and the depiction of the city and all of that stuff, but uh, pay attention to the dialogue. Uh, the dialogue in the book is very, very good. Um, everyone, has, everyone has a unique voice in this book. It doesn't sound like one person speaking at you, which is really, really cool. And um, his first encounter, his first conversation, which um, after he gets caught in the rain is really, really funny as well. Uh, because I think her opening line is something along the lines of, you know, Tambe Payonka, and when he's soaked to the bone, right? Which is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it, it feels like a very natural conversation, which is something else that Lat does really, really well. So, yeah, check it out. Oh, oh, Adelagi, okay. Sorry, um, last one. <laughs> Sorry, Matso really relate to me because I first read Matso a long time ago when I was very young. And the timing that it was out was also the timing that I moved from Kampong Life to Kuala Lumpur. And there, I started work and I had to go around the world. Again, I could relate with that. So what I'm saying here is that I realized as I grow older, I'm not that old. It's just <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you start off with Kampong, you end up somewhere in the middle in town finding your identity, trying to blend and all that stuff. But most people from Kampung at the end of the day, which I wonder where Masum is going to, or Lad is going to write about Masum, at the end of their life, or towards the end of their life, I hear a lot of people wanting to go back to Kampung life. Well, like Lad. Yeah, like Lad. <laughs> you know, like Dato Lad said, Don't, do not regret your Kampung life. But about um, the last one I would like to share is that with Masum, the character that really... Um, I would say that that, um, that is important to me is when he wanted to say goodbye to his father oh, and he, goes and to his he went to his workplace for the very first time That's right. and realized after years, after decades, more than what, 20 years, then he realized his father was hiding a secret yeah. that he never knew. Then, then he realized well, that's what why he, the kampung people was trying to tell him. Yeah, and also he realized that's why he went back to the city to do what he should lah. Yes. And and follow what his father wants him to do lah. Yes. And then it was so convenient. This girl had a boyfriend already. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, one more. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna be the last. I think. <laughs> sure. I just sure. want to comment on uh, um, that lady over we have there time. Who, yeah. who who was talking about the relatability of Batsum and today's KL. Mm. So uh, I'm just gonna talk about the. Uh, uh, superficially, not not uh, some something 
uh, the deep part of uh, Matsum actually. So I, I've read Matsum uh, countless of times and I think I, I have a fully grasped uh, of the story. Yes. So um, I always regard this part of KL where we're sitting now is actually the new part of KL whereby the old part of KL, which is the Jalan Jokot Rahman, Sogo area, um, along the Datra Badeka and also to the Jalan, uh, Masjid Jame is, is the old part of KL, including the train, sta train station as well. So what I suggest to you is that after you have read, uh, you have read the Matsum, probably you try to go to the Sogo area because I think that is, that is where it took place. I think that is, that is really the, the place where you can really feel the, the presence of the story, you know? Yeah, because yeah. every time I go to, personally, every time I go to Sogo, I immediately reminds me, it rem uh, immediately reminds me of Mansum. Yeah. Oh yeah, so that, all, that all whole the path, yeah. Sogo, Masjid Jame, yes. all of that yeah. area, right? All the different the, scenes. That path, you know. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a suggestion to everyone. Man, there should be a Matsum walking tour. Yeah, that's something we can do. Uh, sorry, I, I have a, an, another one actually. And not, uh, just want to ask you, uh, we talk a lot about the context of Matsum itself, but uh, I, I, I just want to know the, the medium itself, the comic books, and then we claim it as a, one mm. of the, the first graphic novel in Malaysia. So, uh, what this actually uh, tell you, the era, the, the early 90s, the end of 80s actually, uh, about the, the literature actually. Maybe Matsum can be actually writing actually, but a lot actually um, approach it in the comic, the mm. medium of comics actually. So I think in the 80s and 90s or even uh, late 80s, early 90s, Lat was probably one of the few people who could get away with publishing something like this and people taking it seriously. Um, the other guys, I mean, so yeah, Ujang and the Gila Gila guys and all that stuff, their influences came from Mad Magazine and Javi Pika and Crumb and all these people from America. And they were satirists, but they weren't necessary. Now we see them as serious fiction and see serious writers. But back then, I don't think people had the same regard for the medium um, that we do now, for sure. Yeah. I mean, e even Lat also, people didn't have a serious regard for Lat as we do now today, as we understand it today, because now we, now we see comic books as more than just children's stuff, right? Um, and a lot of it has to do with everything, like the movies and all of that stuff. We take it as serious as we possibly can. So in the 80s and 90s, I think that's why I think this was so revolutionary, for him to publish something so meaningful, so deep, uh, that addressed real problems that uh, the Malay immigrant would have coming into the big city, um, yeah, he's got, I mean, so not to say that Gile Gile and Ujang didn't do it, they did it as well, but they would do it in a comedic, satirical fashion. I mean, well, Lat does it in a very serious narrative fashion, so that's why it's so unique. Sorry bro, I'm not letting you off the hook just yet. Oh man, yeah. okay. Never mind, I, I might sit down, but yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> First and foremost, just to comment on what Azalita, Azalita just said, right? Yeah. I don't think there is any in our mind Kampongs anymore. Well, no, there isn't. Like, cause what the gentleman just now said at the back, right. there's KL is actually not as empty as it used to be because <laughs> so much of the young generation yeah. don't have a kampong. It's kampong yeah. KL, right? So they yeah. have nowhere to go back to. Yeah. And then talking about race relations or race assimilation, right? I remember my late father used to tell me that one day we're going to be like Indonesia. Uh, if I can refer to my Chinese friends, right? Eventually, he told me that the Chinese are going to look like Malays as well, you know. We're all going to be beige. Exactly. You know, if you go to Indonesia, if you go to Indonesia, and I, I know most of you have been there, you know, I sometimes get confused, you know, that, are you Chinese? You, you know, can't they, tell they, who's who. Yeah. You can't tell, yeah. The name, even the skin color has changed. Yeah. But I'm not trying to be racist here or, not, or even stereotyping. But the point I make from a Malay perspective, right, if you really want to know the throwback, the real Malays, you go to Brunei. Yeah? yeah, I do business there in Brunei. I go there, I really feel, I really feel that, wow, I really feel Malay when I'm in Brunei. <laughs> okay, but back, to, back to, the, to the last book, the author itself and the books, right? It's how you take out from the book, because everybody has a different uh, take and perspective on comics and literature and whatnot. So just to relate this story in, uh, in England, uh, 
you know, English friend of mine, he, he was reading the uh, Kampong Boy and all that, right? So the book became like a debate between me and him. Oh, this is how you guys are. I said, what do you mean? Uh, you know, this, uh, this whole idea of the lazy native and all that, you know? So, you know, you come to my country and see, you know, we're not, we're, it's not what is depicted, that was depicted then. Now it's different. Even the Malays are confused about themselves now, to be honest with you. So, you know, so this book, to, to be honest with you, like you said, the perspective I take since I was young and, and now, I can see on the floor right now, most of us, I think, uh, you can see the intelligentsia in a sense that we, we, we can have this kind of discourse, but when you go to the street and you take different perspectives, you know, it's a comedy, it's, it's entertaining, you know, so, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, okay. but, but that's the interesting thing about Matsom, right? And he breaks away from the, he breaks away from the whole lazy native trope completely, right, in the book. Everybody, every character you meet in the book is a hard worker. There are no slackers. Uh, Matsom is trying to get a regular paying job. He has to pawn his watch. Um, okay, like maybe the poets are slackers, la, but you know, those are just poets. Huh? Uh, but yeah, so everyone is a, everyone's a hard worker, right? And I think that's a very interesting um, difference as well in the depiction of uh, Malay characters, Chinese characters, Indian characters in, in, in this particular work, as opposed to, like you said, his nostalgia pieces, which, yeah, uh, which sometimes capture that sentiment of the past. La. Yeah. Cool. Do we have a last question? Oh. I have something to just um, make myself clear so there don't be any misunderstanding of things. Uh. No misunderstanding, but you have a loud voice. Just like this, it's a chance for everyone to learn everyone. I mean, it's an opportunity for us to just know more, you move, the thing. Not only check, but everything. I think yeah. that is um, somewhere up there that's very important. The importance of ilmu. Yeah, yeah not only everything. Not only. Everything is important. Generally, knowledge is important. But to know, to be more sophisticated, uh, or whatever the term is, uh, right? to know more things that we can mix the society, community, without yeah, just the energy that we send out, the aura that we set out is all just nice and calm for everyone, and what we want. Yeah. Right. So I think I'm very sure that there are ways that we can do that. Read this book. One way to make it happen, yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, no, I was just going to end it by <laughs> getting you off the hook, yeah. Now, just to, on behalf of Ilham, uh, to thank Uma so much thank for you. coming this, this afternoon. It was fun, thank you. Uh, we hope that you'll come back again and, and talk sure, about something exactly. else. Yeah. Uh, but um, superheroes. Yeah, superheroes. No, no. uh, we have one more week of this exhibition, uh, so please come back and tell your friends. Uh, we close November the twentieth, and we open mid December with a new show called After Work, uh, which is a collaboration between Ilham and Parasite, which is a contemporary art space in Hong Kong. So it should be an interesting show and. Uh, Please like us on Facebook and then you'll get all our kind of late uh, uh, information. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you.